As an EMC consultant for over 10 years, I've had a chance to review or help troubleshoot hundreds of electronic products. I find that most of those products that fail compliance testing are due to poorly designed PC boards. In this presentation, I'll show you design techniques for reducing the EMI risk of your board. There are only three things you can do with electromagnetic fields. They can either be stored, moved, or converted to kinetic energy. To propagate an electromagnetic wave requires a transmission line comprised of two pieces of metal, usually separated by a dielectric. In the case of a standard PC board, this would be the microstrip or strip line and a return plane. This is the cross section of a standard microstrip we're all familiar with. You can see the H field flux wraps around the trace, while the E field is mainly concentrated between the trace and return plane. As we'll see in a moment, the actual signal in the form of an electromagnetic wave travels through the dielectric space between the trace and return plane. The trace merely serves as a waveguide and guides the path of the signal energy. We'll discuss the actual physics of wave propagation and PC boards shortly, but one important concept to understand is that for low frequency signals, the return conduction current path is relatively spread out along the return plane and mostly takes a direct path from load back to the source. We call this the path of least resistance. So what constitutes low frequency? Something less than 50 to 100 kilohertz. So this concept is most important for audio or other low frequency technologies. For high frequency signals, return conduction current path is relatively confined along the return plane and directly underneath the signal trace. We call this the path of least impedance and is due to mutual inductance between the trace and plane. So what constitutes high frequency? Well, something greater than 50 to 100 kilohertz. So this concept is most important for most other digital and RF technologies. Here's a simulation of this concept with the return conduction current in green. For the one kilohertz example on the left, we see the return current is spread out and basically travels from the load directly back to the source. In the one megahertz example on the right, we see the return current located directly underneath the circuit trace. This will be very important when we partition our circuit board between analog and digital circuitry. So let's discuss just how signals move in circuit boards. This will likely be your most important takeaway during this presentation. Most of us designers have been misled in our circuits class. It was at least implied that, that current was electrons flowing through copper wires from source to load. And for DC circuits and ignoring the initial turn on transient, this is accurate. However, the movement of electrons does not occur at near light speed. They are too tightly bound to the copper molecules and only move at about one centimeter per second. For AC circuits, the standard circuit theory model cannot be modeled as simple wires, but as transmission lines. We'll go into the actual physics of signal propagation in a moment, but understanding how digital signals propagate in PC boards will give you a competitive advantage over other companies who may not understand this. To how signals move in PC boards, the circuit's point of view and the field's point of view. In reality, they are related. That is, you can't have one without the other. Now, the circuit theory point of view considers only that signals and power 
were turned back to their sources and was hammered into us as undergraduates. Some EMC seminars still focus on currents flowing in loops, and this is accurate, but as mentioned, is only part of the story. To fully understand low EMI PC board design requires we also consider how the signal energy in the form of an electromagnetic wave propagates in circuit boards. When considering the field's point of view, we need to understand that signal and power transient fields travel in the dielectric space at near light speed, while the conduction and displacement currents simultaneously flow back to the source along the surface of the copper at about one centimeter per second. The important point is that the signal energy is in the fields, not the copper. Ralph Morrison was one of the first to explain how high-frequency digital signals propagated through PC boards. I was fortunate enough to meet him in 2017 while he was giving his last public seminar at 92 years old. He just published his 13th book, Fast Circuit Boards, released in 2018, which discusses the physics I'm about to describe. He's since passed away in 2019, but his last public seminar was recorded and may be found on his website, ralphmorrison.com. One of his favorite quotes is on the slide. Buildings have walls and halls. People travel in the halls, not the walls. Circuits have traces and spaces. Energy and signals travel in the spaces, not the traces. And he was referring to signals propagating through the dielectric space. So here's the basic concepts to understand. We'll go over the details shortly. A transmission line consists of two closely spaced conductors used to move energy from point A to point B. The energy in a transmission line is not in the voltage or current, but in the electric and magnetic fields. E and H fields travel through the dielectric of the board, not through the copper. The fields attach themselves to the copper trace and nearest plane and are steered or guided by that copper. Thus, the copper acts as a waveguide to move the energy from point A to point B. Where we often get into trouble is when a noisy signal shares the same dielectric space or path as a quiet signal. Before we get to the actual physics of wave propagation, we need to understand the concept of displacement current. Consider a capacitor charged by a battery. Once the transient settles down, we'll end up with a plus charge on the top plate. This plus charge repels like plus charges on the bottom plate, inducing a negative charge. Now, if an AC voltage is applied, it will appear as if the capacitor is conducting current. James Maxwell realized this and called the effect displacement current. So let's turn our attention to how digital signals propagate in a simple microstrip. Let's assume a microstrip over a solid return plane as pictured in the cross section. On the left, we have a gate driver, and on the right, a resistive load at the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. The digital signal is actually an electromagnetic wave traveling within the dielectric space between the copper trace and return plane, with the wave front propagating from left to right as the gate goes from high to low state. It is important to note that signal propagation is not through the flow of electrons in copper. The electromagnetic wave induces a conduction and displacement current, which does flow along the surface of the copper, but at a very slow speed of about one centimeter per second, as I mentioned previously. This conduction current is what you'd measure with an, ohm, with an ammeter. For FR4 dielectric, the wave propagates at about half light speed, or about six inches per nanosecond. 
signal propagation occurs via so-called kinks in the electric field as it propagates along the transmission line. To illustrate, a point source is shown in the upper right and assuming free space, this kink in the field propagates away from the source at light speed. Basically, the electrons are so tightly bound to the copper molecules that those that are in the outer rings merely jiggle and induce this jiggling along the line until the load is reached. This jiggle is the kink. Good analogies might include the Newton's cradle on the left. Raising a ball on the left propagates energy through the other balls and pops off the ball at the other end. The balls in the middle technically don't move at all. Another analogy is when a rock is thrown into a pond and ripples start radiating outwards. The actual water molecules don't move much except up and down, yet the wave propagates outward. So understanding how signals propagate as electromagnetic fields, let's dig into some design practices for low EMI PC boards. The rules of board design are relatively simple. Number one, every signal trace needs an adjacent return plane or trace in order to contain the field. And number two, every power trace or plane needs an adjacent return trace or plane to contain the transient field. Importantly, this also includes return paths up and down through layers. This last point would require the addition of ground vias for return to return layers and stitching capacitors for return to power layers. These rules dictate the stack up design. And this is why many PC board designs are the root cause of EMC compliance test failures. If we don't get the stack up right, we risk sharing the same dielectric space between high and low level signals. For example, if we allow the fields from a motor driver to cross couple with the fields from analog circuits, we'll get noise coupling. This can happen if we were to add a signal layer between the power and return planes. We can solve this by adding a second return plane. Now the power transients will occupy a different dielectric space than the analog fields. So let's discuss stack ups. Most four layer boards I review use this very common but very high EMI risk stack up. The first thing to note is that the power and return planes are too far separated for good high frequency decoupling. Thus, you'd expect to see power transients being radiated. For best high frequency decoupling, the power and return layer should be no more than two to three mils apart, and closer is even better. The second point to note is that there is a signal layer referenced to the power plane. Return conduction currents want to flow back to the source, which is referenced to the return plane, not power. However, yes, it's possible to reference to the power plane for non-critical circuits, if and only if the power and return planes are very closely coupled together and with adequate decoupling capacitors. I still don't recommend this though, especially for critical high frequency applications, such as wireless or mixed signal designs. There are probably many solutions to the typical four layer conundrum, but here's a couple that will work well for you to achieve lowest EMI. In each, we're running signals and routed power on one layer with an adjacent ground return plane on the top and bottom sides. The only difference is whether the reference planes are on the outer or inner layers. The advantage in running the signals and power on an outer layer is that they are easier to get at for troubleshooting. On the other hand, 
the advantage of positioning the reference planes on the outer layers is that, that they can be stitched with vias around the edge to provide a Faraday cage effect for better board shielding. This could be an advantage for RF or wireless designs. The disadvantage for both is that you'll need adequate decoupling capacitors at each power and return pin for critical ICs. Most six layer boards I review use this very common but very high risk stack up on the left. The first thing to note is that the power return the power and return planes are too far separated for good high frequency decoupling. Thus, again, you'd expect to see power transients being radiated. For best high frequency decoupling, the power and return layer should be no more than two to three mils apart, as I mentioned earlier, and closer is even better. The second point to note is that, again, like the four layer design, there is a signal layer reference to the power plane. Return conduction currents want to flow back to the source, which is usually referenced to the return plane, not power. Finally, any power transients will couple into the two inner signal layers because they are using the same dielectric space as the power ground return planes. The stack up on the right follows this, the basic stack up rules for low EMI and alleviates every issue above. The disadvantage is that you lose one signal layer. Now what about one or two layer boards? For either one or two layer board designs, Dan Beaker of NXP Semiconductors suggests using what's called triplets. A triplet is simply a signal return trace located between two signal traces with minimum spacing. The electromagnetic field is trapped between the signal and return traces and is routed where needed, as shown in the bottom part of the diagram. For power nets, keep a minimum spacing between power and power return traces, as shown in the upper part of the diagram. For two layer boards, the minimum spacing of the power nets and triplets may be relaxed, assuming a solid ground return plane. Here's an example of a two layer board with ground fill on the top layer and signals and routed power on both layers. Note that the critical data and address bus lines of this CAN transceiver are routed as triplets. Here's a handy list of guidelines for two layer board designs by Dr. Eric Bogatin, extracted from his Bogatin's Book of 10 Lists, available on his website signalintegrityacademy.com. I won't go over each item, but would encourage listeners to check out his website for much more information on signal integrity, power integrity, and EMI. He's also written an excellent book on these subjects, Signal and Power Integrity Simplified. So now let's turn our attention to one other common board design problem I often deal with. That is discontinuous signal return paths. Now that we understand the importance of keeping a continuous copper path to bound the electromagnetic wave of the signal, these design issues should become more obvious. If that return path includes gaps or slots, the electromagnetic field now unbound at that spot, will leak throughout the dielectric space and couple to all other signals occupying that same dielectric space. For low EMI applications, we must keep the field bound between two pieces of metal at all times. As we saw earlier, the electromagnetic field is guided by the signal trace and the conduction current flows directly under the trace along the return plane. All too often, I find a gap or slot in this return path where the signal has changed reference planes without a defined return current path. Let me illustrate in the next few slides. <laughs> 
Now let's look at an example of wave propagation through a return plane. The dielectric is not shown for simplicity, but just imagine it lies between the circuit trace and return plane where the red waves are shown. In the top diagram, the signal travels out from the source along the trace through a via and along more trace to the load. Notice that the displacement current has a defined path back to the source between the circuit traces and return plane. The electromagnetic field is also bound along the whole path. The bottom figure is similar except the signal path runs through the return plane twice. In each case, the displacement current and field has a defined path back to the source between the circuit traces and return plane. Now here's a case where we will run into trouble if we don't define an explicit return path for the displacement current and field energy. In this case, the signal trace runs between two planes through a via. The signal runs through the via, but there's a gap down to the second plane where it continues on to the load. Note that the, the displacement return current no longer has a defined return path back to the source. So this causes the electromagnetic wave to leak and start propagating both directions within the dielectric space between the two planes. This can excite the PC board to resonate, coupled to other signals occupying the same dielectric space, as well as cause board edge radiation between the two planes. To resolve this depends on the voltage potentials of the two planes. If the two planes are the same potential, for example, both are ground return planes, stitching vias can be added between the planes close to the signal path via in order to keep the field bound at all times. If the two planes are at different potentials, for example, plus 3.3 volts and ground return, then stitching capacitors must be connected between the two planes, ideally two located very close to the circuit via. Now here's an example where we're running a high speed signal trace across an isolated analog circuit crossing two gaps in the return plane along the way. There are two issues here. First, the high-speed signal is crossing two gaps in the return plane, which forces the displacement and conducted return currents to flow around the gaps back to the source. Some of the field energy of the propagating wave also follows the gaps and out the edge, causing circuit board edge radiation and cross coupling to other signals within that same dielectric space. Second, by crossing over the analog return plane, the high speed digital signal is also allowed to contaminate any sensitive analog circuitry in the isolated area, resulting in crosstalk. Let's look at a simplified example of a clock trace crossing a gap in the return plane. At high frequencies, the differential mode current will return directly under the trace due to mutual coupling. Introducing a gap in the return plane causes a differential to common mode conversion, which causes H field flux wrapping around the return plane and leakage within the dielectric space which in turn couples the clock signal to other victim traces throughout the board. We'll see an example in, in, in the experiment on the next couple slides. I have a video demonstration of why gaps in return planes are bad on my website, emc-seminars.com, which you can view later. But first, I wanted to run through the demonstration verbally. This is a very easy demonstration you can show your colleagues. In the video, we'll be taking a double-sided copper-clad circuit board and testing two traces, which are merely insulated wires taped down to the copper plane of approximately 50 ohms impedance. We'll drive one end with a 10 megahertz, three volt pulse, and with a rise time of two nanoseconds. And this will produce a family of harmonics spaced every 10 megahertz and will simulate a high-speed clock. 
The other end of the wire is terminated in a 50 ohm resistive load. I'll use an H field probe, moving it along each wire to sense the return current path and indicate why this is a bad design practice. And you'll see that the gap causes an increase in the measured signal, which will result in an increase in radiated emissions, an increase in radiated susceptibility, and an increase in ESD susceptibility. You can also see the coupling to the unconnected victim wire. Near the end of the video, I connect a one meter long clip lead to the board return plane. This will simulate a shielded IO cable, such as a USB cable. The gap in the return plane is causing common mode currents to form on the return plane, which then flow out along the attached wire. Placing a current probe around the wire shows the high frequency currents flowing through the wire, which result in the wire becoming an antenna and radiating. You can see the 10 to 15 dB difference in emissions spectrum between the gapped in violet and the ungapped traces in aqua. The important thing to note is that the resulting common mode currents are the dominant source of radiated emissions. Now, with our understanding that return currents and their related electromagnetic fields tend to stay bound between the circuit traces and return plane, one more technique to avoid cross-coupling between the various circuit functions is to partition or segregate these major functions. The example above illustrates the basic concept whereby RF wireless, digital, motor control, and analog functions are grouped together in separate partitions, thus minimizing coupling from one to the other. We also see that all the circuit filtering and transient protection is grouped right at the I.O. and power connectors, with switch mode power supply circuitry also located at the power input. Note also that all the I.O. and power connectors are grouped close together along one edge of the board. If this board is mounted in a chassis structure, then it's also important to bond the board to chassis with several low impedance posts as close to the connectors as possible. Both these techniques help reduce radiated emissions. Main digital power, for example, the plus 3.3 volts, can be a, either a plain or routed along with other required voltages. Just a few comments on power distribution networks or PDMs. As mentioned, it's a good idea to use a solid plane for the main DC power, such as the 3.3 volt bus. It should be immediately adjacent to a solid ground return plane. Use routed power or power polygons for the remaining voltage of buses required. Remember that PDNs are transmission lines and therefore all voltage buses need to be adjacent to a return plane. It's okay to use a signal return plane so long as the power transients and signal currents don't occupy the same dielectric space. Partitioning helps with this or because of skin effect at high frequencies, you can use one side of a signal return as power return and reserve the other side as signal return. That is a signal return plane, power tracer plane will work fine. A typical PDM will include many parasitic components, mainly inductors and capacitors within the IC package board structure and added decoupling or bulk capacitors. The idea is to keep the resulting PDN impedance as low as possible throughout the operating frequency range and without large parallel resonances or peaking. In the diagram, left to right, we see the impedance of the voltage regulator module, or VRM, any bulk capacitance, a combination of built-in board capacitance and decoupling capacitors, 
And finally, the on-dye capacitance within the IC itself. All these components have associated serious parasitic inductances, which, if too large, defeats the performance of the capacitance and will raise the overall PDN impedance. This slide illustrates how the power distribution networks works as a transmission line connecting, connecting the various capacitors, which serve as energy storage in the form of voltage and supply current to replenish the voltage drop during the time the output gate switches from high to low and vice versa. So let's work from right to left this time. When the IC output switches, it calls for energy from the on-chip and board capacitance. When that capacitor starts to empty, it calls to be replenished by the nearest decoupling capacitors. When they start depleting, they'll call to be replenished by the volt capacitance. Because it takes a certain amount of time to recharge the energy level of the capacitors, during this time of recharging, the PDN serves as a series of transmission lines which transport the energy flow to the IC and resulting depletion waves, which are calling for more energy. Thus, we have multiple electromagnetic waves moving back and forth between bulk capacitor and IC as each energy storage capacitor supplies and calls for more energy. When it comes to decoupling capacitors, there's a wide variety of opinions. Historically, we've used 0.1 or 1.0 microfarad, but recent technology for surface mount devices has reduced the package series inductance to the point where some have recommended using up to 22 microfarads in the smallest package possible. Knowing the importance of keeping the overall impedance low in PDMs, we see that any series inductance when mounting these decoupling and bulk capacitors can seriously degrade their high frequency and energy supply performance. This is one reason I don't recommend placing ferrite chokes in series anywhere along the PDM. And that includes right at the, the IC power pins. The only exception might be for RF, analog, or PLL circuits. In this plot, we can see that the smaller surface mount packages have lower series inductance, and you can see this in the family of impedance curves for a 0.1 microfarad capacitor in various sized packages. And you, you can see that the 0603 has much better high frequency performance than the 1206 package, for example. Dr. Todd Hubing has a set of guidelines for where decoupling capacitors need to be placed. If the power and return planes are less than four mils apart, then the location of decoupling capacitors doesn't matter as much, and they can merely be sprinkled around the board evenly. However, if the power and return planes are greater than 10 mils apart, then the capacitor position becomes very important and each IC will need one or more decoupling capacitors. Note also that wide spaced power and return planes can also lead to cavity resonances, which can accentuate uh, emissions. If there are no power return planes, for example, if the power is routed, then he advises at least three decoupling capacitors per power pin. Better to have closely spaced power and return planes, I'd say. It's very important to minimize any series inductance when mounting decoupling capacitors. And this slide illustrates various low impedance board connections. The idea is to minimize the connecting trace length in order to minimize the series inductance. In fact, there are some that advocate multiple vias in parallel to connect the capacitor. In addition, the overall loop inductance connecting the capacitor should be minimized. It's often helpful to design the stack up such that the power and return planes are near the top of the stack. 
for critical low EMI applications, you may wish to use the newer interdigitated or X2Y capacitors that have extremely low series inductance. Normal MLCCs might have around 500 picohenries of series inductance, while the newer multi-leaded devices have less than 100 picohenry inductance. You can often trade dozens of decoupling capacitors for just a few of the low inductance ones and achieve the same or better decoupling performance. Now here's an interesting experiment conducted by Robert Dockey of Hewlett Packard. He worked for the inkjet printer division and the designers were curious as to how the board shape might affect radiated emissions. Dockey experimented with four board dimensions. All were 280 millimeters long. The width was varied from 280 to 120 to 45 to 10 millimeters, that is from square to very thin. He then drove a one inch 50 ohm trace terminated with 50 ohms mounted in the center of each board. The trace was driven with a constant amplitude RF signal from 30 to 1000 megahertz and measured in a semi anechoic chamber, just like the real product. The result was interesting. The thinner the board, the more it appeared as a dipole antenna and the more it radiated. This may guide your thinking when designing products. Avoid long, thin PC boards. The next experiment was to vary the dielectric spacing between the trace and the return plane. A board of size 120 by 240 millimeters was used for this experiment. The previous experiment was performed with a dielectric spacing of 62 mils, which is a standard FR4 board thickness. A second board with the same dimensions was designed with a dielectric spacing of 8 mils and then compared with the original. The result was a decrease of about 16 dB in radiated emissions with the closer spacing. As we wrap up, here is a suggested summary of steps when designing your boards. Number one, choose a stack up and be sure each signal and power layer has an adjacent return plane. Number two, Partition the different circuit functions as best you can to separate noisy from quiet circuits. Number three, lay out the power planes and routed power. Four, place all the decoupling caps as close to the related ICs as possible. This is not nearly as critical for power to return spacing less than three mils. Number five, route and minimize clock traces. Six, route data and address buses. Number seven, double check return paths to eliminate gaps. And this is usually the first thing I check when I do a design review. I'll, I'll basically look at all the return planes to see how many gaps and slots they have. And finally, number eight, route low speed or control lines. For those who are consistently designing PC boards, I'd highly suggest connecting with these two gentlemen. Rick Hartley offers a two-day intensive seminar in PC board design for low EMI and best circuit performance. Dan Beaker of NXP Semiconductor presents occasional one-day seminars on board design for low EMI and best performance as well. He also has a short presentation linked to the NXP website that provides an introduction to his full seminar. Both teach from an electromagnetic fields viewpoint, which I believe is extremely important to understand. I've taken both their seminars and found them excellent. When you understand that when noisy and quiet sig signals share the same dielectric space, you can expect EMI 
crosstalk and noise coupling with resulting EMI failures. Using these techniques for designing your stack up and partitioning to prevent sharing the same dielectric space will greatly reduce the risk of EMI and endless board spins. Finally, here is a more complete listing of related PC board design resources that I trust. I also have several short videos which demonstrate various measurement techniques and illustrate common design issues on my website. I appreciate your attention, and if anyone has questions after this presentation is over, feel free to contact me through my website, emc-seminars.com. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Sierra Circuits, for hosting that webinar. We do have several uh, questions. And if you have uh, a question, uh, please type it now in the Q&A panel that you'll find uh, the icon at the bottom of your screen. So why don't we, uh, why don't we take some of these questions from the top. Um, so here's a common question. Uh, what about split return planes? Uh, good question, and um, I think most uh, most trainers. Um, well, let, let's put it this way: there, there's some debate on that, but I think uh, most of the people that I trust uh, are suggesting to um, to not use split return planes, and one of the reasons is um, if you have an I.O. cable attached to each plane, say an analog cable um, with the shield bonded to the analog plane and uh, a digital cable, for example, USB, uh, whose shield is bonded to the digital plane, you will often find uh, small uh, differences in potential between those two planes. And um, if you consider the two cables as, a, as two elements of a dipole antenna, you now have a high frequency um, signal between those two planes, and it's going to drive those cables just like an antenna. And uh, so by connecting the two, or by using a, a solid plane for the return, uh, you alleviate that problem. Now, you do have to be careful um, about where you locate the analog section from the digital section, for example, and uh, that's where partitioning comes in, uh, into play. Uh, and and just, a, just a few more words about partitioning. Uh, the slide where I showed the concept of partitioning is probably not completely realistic in, in every design case. Uh, examples of that would be um, the fact that you uh, want to locate things like uh, USB ICs and Ethernet circuitry uh, closest to the to their connectors. So uh, the USB connector you'd, you'd have uh, from the connector you'd have any filtering uh, for, for example, common mode filtering, uh, and then the circuitry for the USB. Uh, same for the Ethernet. So I, I would not want to run Ethernet clocks or USB clocks all the way across your board. So uh, that's that's my take on uh, on return planes. I'd rather that there's you, you'll you'll find if if you lay out your circuitry carefully such that uh, your basic circuit functions don't share the same dielectric space, in other words, use partitioning, uh, there's usually no reason to split the return planes. Um, there's another question which um, I get fairly often, and that is um, regarding ground fill. Um, 
is ground fill important? And what they mean by that is um, uh, in between all the routed traces and so forth, um, uh, there, there are some that advocate uh, filling that, that space with, um, with ground return. Now, um, I, I used to think that was okay until I spoke with or discussed this with uh, Dr. Eric Bogatin, and uh, he advises against that. Um, he says often it doesn't do anything to help, and sometimes it can hurt. And um, I, I think if you are not careful and run a signal, a high frequency signal trace across a bunch of split um, ground fill areas, uh, that could act like a, a split in the return plane. So just something to be careful of. Uh, here's another very common question. And, um, uh, fr from from Carla, uh, do you think that to have different kinds of ground return planes, for example, analog ground, uh, chassis ground, power ground, and uh, I assume digital ground, uh, is effective? And um, interestingly, uh, one of my mentors, um, Dr. Tom Van Doren from the University of uh, Missouri. Uh, he, he also consults, um, he's, he's uh, semi-retired now, but um, uh, still, still does a fair amount of consulting. And he says, when I see uh, several different symbols for ground on a schematic, I know I have consulting work. And uh, what you need to be careful of when you have multiple uh, ground references like that is um, uh, you, you have to be very careful uh, what the path of return current is for each uh, circuit function, whether it's a power circuit or analog circuit or digital circuit. And um, it's, it's just best, in my opinion, to use a single reference uh, for return currents, for, for signal and power returns. And uh, that way you uh, can avoid potential issues of uh, where the return currents are, uh, what path they're taking. So good question. I, I see that often and um, uh, you need to be careful. Um, you can really get into trouble uh, from an EMI point of view if you're not uh, tracing out exactly what those return paths are for each signal and power. And by splitting all those uh, different grounds, um, you're, you're, um, you're increasing your risk, I shall say. Now, the, the last three points I made, um, uh, the, the, the last three questions I answered, uh, very often you will um, see these, these uh, promoted within uh, IC uh, manufacturers' data sheets. Uh, for example, splitting grounds and, and um, you know, using different ground references, analog, digital, and so forth. Uh, you, you'll see those in data sheets and um, the, the thing to keep in mind is that you don't want to trust a data sheet unless you can prove that the advice is, is correct. And um, in, in a, lot of these, a lot of these data sheets were written years ago uh, before really, you know, we started using really high frequency mixed signal designs and so forth. So generally, um, I, I just don't trust them unless, unless uh, I approve otherwise. <laughs> so um, let's see, we still have a few minutes left. Uh, let me go on with some other questions. Uh, Wasim asks, uh, to reduce the EMI of IO connectors on a board, 
what's the best approach to terminate the shielding of these connectors? And would the signal return path connected directly to the shielding be better or provide a low impedance path using a capacitor and splitting the shield ground from signal return? Okay, a um, couple, couple points there. Uh, it, it depends. And um, one of the dependencies is whether your product uses a shielded enclosure or not. Um, generally, whether it's shielded or unshielded, that, that um, IO cable shield should go to the um, primary signal return plane. Uh, in most cases, that would be your digital return. And um, I might add that you want those connectors, the, all the I.O. connectors uh, tightly grouped together along one edge of the board. Um, this is a, a topic I teach in my uh, longer seminars, but um, again, if, if you remember back to that first question where we have uh, separate analog and digital return planes, uh, if you get any voltage between uh, two connector uh, shells, for example, uh, so, say you put uh, a connector on each each end of your board. So you've got this noise source of the board itself in the middle between two uh, I/O cables, and and that should immediately um, trigger the uh, your your mind as as you know that that's an ideal uh, dipole antenna with the voltage source driving the, the center between two uh, cables. And the same, same point goes, uh, you know, if you uh, space out your, your I.O. connectors, and that's, that's why I like to see them grouped together. So uh, yes, uh, connect the cable shields uh, through the connector housing back to digital return. And, um, the idea of connecting a, a or making a low impedance path using a capacitor and then splitting the shield ground from signal return is um, problematic because the, the capacitor is um, frequency dependent and uh, would be only be effective in a, in a small range of frequencies. Now sometimes this is done for very low data rate uh, sensors to avoid uh, ground loops. So, um, so basically it's a, it's a hybrid ground where um, the uh, low frequencies are, are broken by the capacitor, but the capacitor still allows high frequencies to pass and connect that, that uh, shield um, in, in a high frequency manner. So uh, let's, let's go on to Jesse's question. For a two-layer board with a bus like an SPI port, should the triplet concept be expanded to intersperse ground traces between each signal? Uh, yeah, you could do that. Uh, that's uh, certainly uh, uh, doable, absolutely. Um, you can either use a, uh, a ground return trace between two signal wire or, uh, wires or traces, or uh, intersperse them, uh, signal ground, signal ground return. So that, that's definitely uh, doable. Um, Mike asks, uh, will these slides from the presentation today be made available after the webinar? Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Sierra Circuits will, will make this available uh, to a wider audience. Um, and the reason is, uh, you know, this is a worldwide uh, webinar. Uh, some people are still in bed, so so we have to um, um, help them by uh, by making this um, a clickable presentation. Uh, let's see. So we've got uh, several questions on the same. So same question whether the, it'll be um, available later. Um, 
Okay, uh, here, here's a question from uh, Fisayo. Um, is the context of dielectric space confined to proximity? Uh, I'm not exactly sure what is meant by that, but um, if you consider a, uh, an electromagnetic field, um, if, if you're gonna move that field energy from point A to point B, it needs to be trapped between two pieces of metal. Uh, think, think of a railroad track. Uh, and the train following that railroad track, if you, if you break that track somewhere, that train is going to derail. And the, 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 the same uh, analogy can be used um, when it comes to um, the path of the electromagnetic wave within the dielectric space. And so you, you do need to um, have some kind of metal guiding that wave uh, the entire path from point A to point B. Uh, Mark asks, um, on the slide showing the best layout for decoupling capacitors, uh, I showed the vias on opposite sides of the capacitor. Uh, is there a reason you don't place the vias on the same side of the capacitor as close to the PC? board design uh, uh, rules allow, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Um, in fact, um, uh, there, are, there are some for, for, for certainly high critical or high, high um, frequency or critical circuits, uh, you might want to use multiple vias on, on each end of the capacitor. Um, JP asks, uh, what is the best way to implement board level shielding with respect to grounding and lowering emissions? And I, I, I'm dealing with this uh, frequently. Um, it seems like recently I do a lot of, um, a lot of work uh, with uh, wireless and IoT kinds of products where it's almost uh, imperative to use local shielding. Uh, that local shield should go to the, um, the, the primary uh, digital return um, to allow any kind of radiating uh, induced currents to return back to the source quickly. So uh, yeah, and, and you need to use multiple uh, connection points. You, you can't just use one or two. Uh, if it's an E-field you're shielding, yes, one or, one or two connecting points from the shield back to the digital return uh, is sufficient, but most of the fields that we shield against are magnetic or H fields, and uh, that requires multiple uh, legs between or connection points between the shield and, and the digital return. Um, Eric asks uh, whether we can get the slides so we uh, uh, the slide deck as, as a form of a PDF so we can study it and uh, that the presentation was rather fast and I, I agree there's a lot of material there <laughs> uh, in fact you should you should hear my uh, live seminars I, I, I do uh, go through a lot of slides but um, yeah if you uh, contact me directly um, my email is ken at emc-seminars.com. I'll see that you can get a, uh, a PDF of the, of the slide deck. Okay, we're, um, let's see, we're, we're right about an hour, so uh, there's several other questions. Um, I will answer these uh, offline and get them back to Sierra Circuits to disseminate out to everybody. I really appreciate all your attention. And uh, I know this is um, probably very new material. Um, most instructors do not teach from a field's point of view, but uh, I, I feel that um, knowing the circuit's point of view where, where we're trying to um, minimize the loop areas and and we're concerned with the return paths uh, is important, but uh, to get the complete picture of um, 
good low EMI bore design, uh, you, you really have to consider the field's point of view as well. And I, I hope I communicated that uh, to you uh, today. So uh, thanks again for your attention. Thanks to Sierra Circuits for hosting this seminar. Thank you, Ken.